welcome everyone uh, today. For those of you from the UK, good morning. For those of you from uh, Kazakhstan, good afternoon. Um, today we have the great privilege to have a webinar on a very important topic uh, about the AIFC Court's jurisdiction. It's a topic which has fueled many questions to us at the AIFC Court Registry uh, for some years since our operation from the 1st of January 2018. Um, Lord Mance um, is our Chief Justice at the AIFC Court. Um, if I may say so, on behalf of Lord Mance, he uh, became Chief Justice with effect from the 1st of February this year, 2020, upon the retirement of our first Chief Justice, Lord Wolfe. Uh, Lord Mance was the former uh, president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court and we are extremely fortunate uh, to, that he has agreed to support us today and to give this very important webinar. Today's webinar incidentally is number 24 in our uh, distinguished series of webinars given by our judges and colleagues from the community in Kazakhstan and elsewhere just this year 2020. Before we start formally, I'd just like to inform all of the participants that of course today's webinar is available live in English and and Russian language um, by simply selecting the on top of Zoom, which is being recorded, and the video will be available in English and Russian, I understand, from our AFC Court website in due course. If you wish to ask any question, we encourage you to do so. Uh, please type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, alternatively, if you wish to send an email to our AFC Court info address, please do so, and we'll do our best in the time we have available to answer the questions. A very quick update, if I may, from myself. Uh, firstly, uh, we are continuing at the AFC Court and our uh, International Arbitration Centre, which is a separate legal entity from our AIFC Court, to continue our operations 100% online. We started this with effect from the beginning of the COVID-19 problem from early March this year, and this is set to continue for the foreseeable future. Uh, we are utilising our e-justice electronic filing system, uh, e secure email and videos for hearings, and we are now hearing a significant number of cases, both at the court and the arbitration centre for our stage of operations. And we're doing so uh, using video for hearings and including for case management conferences and mediation consultations. The number of cases now I'm happy to report to everyone is at 266 as shown from our court and arbitration centre websites. That's seven judgments uh, and orders completed and published in English and Russian on the court uh, website um, at the court. 259 mediations and arbitrations. Most of those cases so far at the International Arbitration Centre, or IAC for short, have been uh, mediation cases. We see that as a positive feature of our dispute resolution facility in Kazakhstan at the AFC because the successful resolution of considerable disputes um, involving often some complex areas of the law whether it be AIFC law, Kazakhstan law or Russian law at this stage, um, have been resolved quickly and cost effectively without the need to progress those cases to subsequent arbitration or litigation at the court. So far, our judgments have been enforced to 100% satisfaction, utilising our special step-by-step -step procedure with the local enforcement agents, agencies within Kazakhstan. And the parties have come from uh, Kazakhstan, China, Russia, the United Kingdom, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Poland and others. We now have 205 lawyers registered for rights of audience at our court from a total of 24 jurisdictions which consists of 22 um, countries. We see this as a considerable achievement for ourselves again because it shows the international respect and recognition that we are now achieving uh, from the international global legal community who obviously want to uh, consider representing parties in disputes at our court and also at the arbitration centre. Engagement, well today's webinar is a classic example of what we've been doing for three years now to encourage cooperation uh, with other like-minded institutions around the world but also with you the legal and business community. We want you to know what we're doing, we want to partner with you and work closely together so that you fully understand what it is we can provide to assist you to better represent your clients interests through our court and arbitration center. One way we're doing that today is the second day of our CEDA International Accredited Mediator Skills course. We're training 18 Kazakhstan nationals right now online and we will by the end of this year have completed training for nearly 60 plus uh, people from the Kazakhstan community. Uh, we've provided training on arbitration, on our rules in particular and advocacy. So the types of common law advocacy skills that would be expected if you the lawyers are representing your your clients, uh, the parties in cases at our court. And that is for both online dispute resolution at the court as well as in-person oral advocacy. I've said far too much already, so I will, if I may, uh, hand over to Lord Mance for his uh, webinar. Lord Mance. Thank you very much indeed. 
Um, the title is uh, The Jurisdiction of the Court and the AIFC Court with its attached International Arbitration Centre, the IAC, is a wholly new standalone initiative which the Registrar has uh, just described. It is designed, of course, to guarantee the introduction and the protection of the rule of law um, for investors, businesses and individuals operating in the Astana International Financial Centre or electing to use the court services. The court is created under the constitution of Kazakhstan, but all that Article 3.1 of that constitution actually says about it is that within the city of Noor Sultan, a special legal regime can be established in the financial sphere in accordance with the constitutional law. The special legal regime is, as will appear, particularly special in that it is uniquely in Central Asia, common law based. In what follows, I shall look first at the court's own jurisdiction, uh, the cases initiated before it, and then at its role in relation to IAC arbitrations. We start with the first measure below the constitution of, Cons of Kazakhstan, and that is uh, described as a constitutional statute. It is dated 7th December 2017, and uh, it has some subsequent amendments. And it is the basis uh, of the AIFC and its court, uh, and for the court's uh, jurisdiction in a more specific way. Uh, but we should also bear in mind uh, that it needs to be read with two other important regulations on the court and the IAC, which in fact are both dated two days earlier, 5th of December 2017. Logically, you might think that was the wrong way around. The constitutional statute is logically the foundational document from which the other documents spring. But um, it's not so in timing, uh, or I think in reality. In reality, it seems clear that all these three documents must be regarded as a package, a homogeneous package and understood in the light of each other. The constitutional statute of the 7th of December 2015 describes the AIFC as having the general purpose of establishing a leading international centre for financial services. And more specifically, it identifies objects such as tracking inward investment, developing a securities market, insurance markets, banking services, Islamic finance, financial technology, electronic commerce innovative projects and financial and professional services based on international best practice. And it is to operate on principles set out in Article 2, efficiency and transparency of AIFC activities and participants, integrity, professionalism, observance of international standards and best practice in such activities. There is under Article 6 a special tax regime, no doubt, um, attractive involving significant long-term tax exemptions uh, right up to um, uh, 2066 including from corporate and in certain areas individual tax and article 9 uh, introduces various other AIFC bodies um, including the court and the IAC um, we start with the management council then there's the governor then there's the AIFC authority and then there's the financial services authority uh, and then there is the court and the IAC. And um, all these um, bodies are provided to be independent in the exercise of the powers given them by the constitutional statute and by particular acts. The first is, as I've said, the council, which is given specific power to adopt AIFC acts and to determine the structure of other AIFC bodies. So it has a superior role and it appoints the management of the Financial Services Authority and determines the power of the governor. But under um, Article 4, Paragraph 5, all AIFC bodies can adopt acts regulating civil, financial and administrative relationships for their participants in their activities. The court and the IAC are established by Articles 13 and 14 and these contain four critical jurisdictional provisions which I'm going to study in detail. But uh, first let me draw attention to um, a particular provision of Article uh, 13 or particular provisions. Um, first, the court is provided to be independent in its activities 
and is not a part of the judicial system of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Second, decisions of the court's court of appeal are final and not subject to appeal and are binding on all natural and legal persons. And third, very important in pragmatic terms, decisions of the courts of the Republic uh, of Kazakhstan um, are to be enforced in the AIFC, uh, but also uh, there is provision for enforcement um, by um, uh, the Republic of Kazakhstan courts um, or by the procedures um, established in the Republic of AIFC court judgments. The court's independence is also emphasized in lower order instruments, as we shall see. Um, so, well, it can be said that the whole AIFC, in fact, um, operates independently from the rest of Kazakhstan um, in a separate legal sphere, as the Constitution of Kazakhstan indicates. Uh, the court's independence is particularly stressed. The um, courts um, are, according to the constitutional statute, to um, have an acting law, um, which I suppose one can transpose as meaning a governing law, and that's based on a hierarchy which starts with the constitutional statute and then refers to AIFC acts adopted by the council or other AIFC bodies. And thirdly, it refers to the acting law of the Republic. But this is only referred to, as I see it, as a final fallback in relation to matters not governed by the constitutional statute or any AIFC act. Um, and in view of the very complete system of AIFC law, which has been developed, um, as I shall also show, um, and in view of um, the court's express ability to draw on general common law jurisprudence, I'll come back to that too, and in view of the choice of law provisions to which I shall also come, I don't envisage that this third element of the acting law, that is, uh, apply the acting law of the public, will in practice prove significant. So we can regard the AIC itself as independent, but the court as applying a legal system, which is in practice um, its own legal system, uh, operating uh, independently with a firm common law basis. What about the structure of the AIFC bodies? Um, more flesh uh, was put on this by the council some six months later on the 26th of May 2017. And it listed once again in the same AIFC bodies. It regulated in detail the governor's position and his powers, uh, and it made certain um, subordinate regulatory provisions. It also um, established the Financial Services Regulatory Authority and the AIFC Authority. And um, more importantly, once again, uh, the structure resolution, as I shall call it, provided with clarity uh, for the independence and status of the AIFC court and the IAC. And it did this in sections five and six, which of the structure regulation of uh, May 2017, which I think it's worth reading in a little detail, because um, section five, um, paragraph, um, 33 reads, the AIFC's courts are an independent body operating within the framework of a separate budget. And secondly, 34, notwithstanding any other provisions herein, all of the AIFC's body bodies are subject to the jurisdiction of the AIFC courts in accordance with the constitutional law. For the avoidance of doubt, the AIFC courts are not subject to the powers of any of the AIFC bodies in the exercise of their judicial functions within the AIFC. And then it repeats the AIFC courts are guided by the applicable law. But then 36, it goes on, the AIFC's courts shall have the sole power to determine the proper scope of its jurisdiction within the limits of its competence given by the applicable law. It says all operational issues required for the proper execution of the objectives of the AIFC courts shall be carried out by the AIFC authority. And in case of disagreement regarding operational issues between the courts and the AIFC authority, they should be settled by the governor on his or her own. That's so much for the courts. Um, section six deals with the IAC. Um, saying it's an out-of-court dispute resolution body with its own arbitration rules, 
which aims to be one of the leading international institutions for commercial dispute resolution, providing efficient, flexible, and impartial administration of arbitration and other ADR procedures. And it shall be established and act in accordance with the resolution of the Council on the International Arbitration Center. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, uh, that's an important um, resolution, just as the similar resolution for the court is one I will come back to. So we see again the key features of independence, separate budget, jurisdiction over all other AIFC bodies, for the avoidance of doubt not subject to the powers of any other AIFC bodies in the exercise of judicial functions, guided by the applicable law, which I've touched on, and sole power to determine the proper scope of its own jurisdiction within the limits of the competence given by the applicable law. Well, let us go back. Uh, then to the constitutional statute to ascertain the extent of the court. We find critical heads to find Article 31 and 4. First, the judicial, uh, uh, Article 1 says the judicial settlement of disputes specified by paragraph. First, disputes between AIFC participants, bodies, and um, uh, uh, employees. Second, disputes relating to activities conducted in the AIFC and governed by the acting law of the AIFC. Third, disputes transferred to the AIFC court by agreement of the parties. And then the fourth one is uh, appears in Article 1310, which adds the AIFC court has exclusive jurisdiction to interpret AIFC acts. So, the fourth is in exclusive competence to interpret AIFC acts. Then um, the um, first is um, exclusive competence over internal AIFC disputes, um, as we can call them. Third is exclusive competence over activities conducted in the AIFC governed by the acting law of the AIFC. And that would cover the wide range of transactions which I've already mentioned the AIFC is set up to promote every sort of investment, inward investment activity, financial activity, and so on, professional services. And then um, the fourth and most important uh, provision um, for exclusive competence over disputes transferred to the court by agreement of the parties. I'll come back to that, but this it is envisaged will in due course be a central pillar of the court's workload as its reputation grows and as parties come to know about it and to appreciate the spirit in which it's been conceived and in which it in fact operates. The court is, as the registrar has already mentioned, uh, already active and um, undertaking any other mediations. And while mentioning mediation, it's appropriate to record that, that the court has a special responsibility to encourage mediation under Article 25 of the Court Regulations, to which I shall be coming, Article 5 reads, the Court shall encourage the parties to a case whenever appropriate to, do so, to resolve their disputes by resorting to arbitration or mediation or any other method of ADR, and may take into account any failure or any failure to do so in good faith when determining who shall pay and the quantum of any order for costs. So there is a little sanction there. Uh, if proceedings um, are necessary, um, your failure to act in good faith in seeking to settle may be relevant to costs. Now, it is to the court's credit, in my view, it's uh, the, the registrar who has been very active in this area, that it has made very positive and successful efforts to encourage mediation using its premises as well as arbitration. This saves the parties the expense of even starting proceedings. Um, what has been done is in the hope, uh, uh, often successful, that proceedings will be avoided, and that I, I commend. Let me now turn to the court regulations which I've touched on. They come on the 5th of December 2017, as I mentioned, uh, two days before, in fact, the constitutional um, statute. Um, and um, they, um, contain a, 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 another whole section on jurisdiction, Article 26, which effectively mirrors the provisions of the constitutional statute um, regarding the four heads of exclusive jurisdiction. 
and it also reiterates the court's exclusive interpretive authority over the reach, the scope of these provisions by providing in Article 26.9 that any issue as to whether a dispute falls within the jurisdiction of the court shall be by the court whose decision shall be final. But there is one um, important clarification of the fourth head of jurisdiction, that um, case is transferred into the court by agreement. And that clarification is in Article 26.3 reading, the reference to transferred to the court by agreement of the parties applies to all parties including parties not registered in the AIFC court, so that all parties may opt into the jurisdiction of the court by agreement to give the court jurisdiction pre or post dispute. In other words, that means you can simply start in the court. You don't have to first start in the courts of the Republic of Kazakhstan or overseas. Um, you can, um, Simply start and transfer includes um, initiating proceedings in the AIFC court without any previous proceedings anywhere else. And that is important. Um, parties um, can, it means, of course, that parties can agree in, an in their contracts on the jurisdiction of the AIFC court before any dispute arises. And that is the basis of much commercial court jurisdiction in London. And it is hoped and anticipated it will be the basis of much AIFC court activity. Um, the incorporation of choice of court clauses in favour of the AIFC court in commercial contracts of companies doing business in and with Kazakhstan is already common, including, uh, mention uh, one specific uh, Corporation Chevron, and it is a considerable recognition uh, of the potential significance of the AIFC courts. Again, I commend the Registrar for his efforts in this regard. Uh, but of course, disputes are not conjured out of the air. Parties don't create disputes um, uh, for the benefit of the courts or if they can avoid them. Uh, and indeed, disputes are not something positively to welcome, although individual disputes have an important function in giving general guidance to future uh, courts. But um, already the court is beginning to see port activity, uh, approaching its 10th active case to add to the many arbitrations and mediations which are being conducted under its aegis. Now, there is a caveat about the consensual jurisdiction, the fourth head, which I've been stressing, and that's found in Article 26.10, the AIFC court is essentially a court focused on the AIFC, addressing AIFC matters, internal and external, um, and disputes which makes, um, make sense for a common law based court to undertake. For example, um, uh, inward investment disputes, um, often based on international law, are the sort of subject matter which um, the common law is um, quite familiar with. Um, but there are other types of dispute which um, may not be so suitable for the AIFC court. Um, purely um, national disputes based on purely national legislation, which the court um, has um, no familiarity with, which has no common or connection, um, perhaps even no linguistic connection. So a certain discretion is preserved by the court regulations to ensure that the court doesn't overreach in terms of its sensible ability to serve the needs of users and of Kazakhstan. Now that's in no way to suggest that the court's um, judges will be reluctant to accept consensually conferred jur jurisdiction which parties agree to confer on it. Um, we are used to handling difficult factual and legal issues, often involving foreign law and languages. The provision I mentioned is merely a sensible proportion. Um, which is protective, um, not just of the courts uh, and its reputation, but of, above all, of users to ensure sensible dispute resolution, uh, which should be the aim of any court or dispute resolution body. Now, um, I mentioned that um, disputes of a criminal or administrative nature are not within the court's jurisdiction. Um, it's concerned with civil or commercial disputes, uh, but um, too narrow an interpretation, uh, too broad an interpretation should not be put on administrative. Um, there is, of course, a question mark as to what it means, um, but I think the 
question is helpfully answered by my predecessor and the registrar in the 2018 annual report of the court where they stated the term administrative is used to refer to matters such as road traffic offences or immigration issues which are dealt, dealt with by the Republic's administrative court. It is not intended to limit the review by the court or an AIC body such as the Financial Services Authority or regulator. Uh, it differs from its meaning in English law and they refer in this context to Article 26.5 of the AIFC court regulations as confirming that uh, that article reads, the court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine an appeal from the decision of an AIFC body where the appeal relates to a question of law, an allegation of a miscarriage of justice, an issue of procedural fairness, or a matter provided for in or under AIFC law. Now, at common law, those questions would typically be regarded as administrative law issues, but um, for the purposes of the AIFC court's jurisdiction, they are expressly not administrative law. They count as civil or commercial law issues, and that fits um, very well with uh, the constitutional statutes provision that the AIFC court has exclusive jurisdiction uh, over the validity and competence of um, AIC, AIFC body acts. Now, um, the um, court also has a small claims court as part of it, um, with a right to appeal to the court, the AFC court itself. And um, most court cases, that no other than small claims cases, will be heard by the court itself, uh, with a further internal appeal to the AFC court of appeal. And again, that system is sealed and watertight because, as I've already mentioned. Uh, the AIFC Court of Appeal decisions are final. There is no appeal for them anywhere else. They can't be challenged in the Republic uh, of Kazakhstan courts um, or elsewhere. They have to be enforced there. And once again, um, the regulation, the court regulation, states the complete independence of the judges while performing their functions. And Article 11 2 adds for good measure neither the government of the Republic nor the AIFC authority or any other person or entity shall interfere with the judicial duties of the Chief Justice of the Court or judges. So um, I um, turned to the question of applicable or governing law um, and that's dealt with in um, briefly in the court regulations but it's also covered by another general uh, regulation and specific AIFC regulations. The court regulations in Article 29 draw attention to the constitutional statute and AIFC regulations, uh, but go on to recognize a, an important point, uh, namely parties' freedom of choice that links with the ability to agree uh, on the use of the court. It's logical the parties sh should have the right to agree on uh, what law applies. So um, the court regulations provide that the court shall apply such law as is agreed between the parties unless inconsistent with the public order or public policy of Kazakhstan or failing agreement such law as appears to the court to be the most appropriate on the facts and circumstances of the dispute. And in this respect, the court, um, as provided by um, Article 13.6 of the Constitutional Statute, shall be guided by decisions of the court and decisions made in other common law jurisdictions. Now, armed with um, the powers given in by the structure regulations, the government, the governor on the 20th of December 2017 also developed um, a full body of AIFC law regulating matters such as contract, tort, uh, and so on. Um, but he also, in doing that, addressed the applicable law um, when um, do you apply AIFC contract regulations or when would you apply, for example, um, uh, the regulations, um, the contract rules applicable in India or in the United Kingdom um, if they've been agreed or if they are obviously the most uh, applicable because the contract was purely Indian in its nature um, and comes um, before the courts of Kazakhstan only by reference of specific um, agreement. Um, well, the governor has regulated, as I say, all, all individual topics and also regulated uh, the question when um, um, the law of uh, AIC applies. Um, 
by uh, various regulations, all said to apply within the jurisdiction of the AIFC. In other words, when the AIFC court is exercising its jurisdiction. Um, the general AIFC regulation um, also contains a choice of law provision recognizing uh, that um, parties uh, are free to choose um, law other than AIFC law. Um, and it says um, that um, the rights and liabilities between persons in any civil or commercial matter are to be decided according to the relevant law for the time being in the jurisdiction chosen in accordance with, sub with subsection two. And that's ascertained that jurisdiction um, by looking at, um, insofar as there is a regulatory content, content uh, then uh, it is AIFC um, law. Um, but um, if there is no regulatory content, then it is um, uh, the law of any jurisdiction um, uh, which falls within a, um, a list set out in the regulation, um, which includes the law of a jurisdiction agreed between all the relevant parties, and failing that, the law of any jurisdiction most closely related to the facts and circumstances only third and only last comes the acting law of Kazakhstan, which takes you back in a full circle, I think, to um, um, looking at um, how far AIFC law applies and uh, how far some apply. There are provisions tract, um, which again um, um, reflect Um, parties' freedom of um, provision. Uh, that's um, Article 24, which deals with situations where there's an absence of an express governing law. And simply, if the parties don't specify the government or the contract, the contract is governing law of the AE. Uh, that seems uh, on the face of it um, inconsistent with previous provisions, which say that where there's no specific agreement, you take a um, look to the law most closely related to the facts and circumstances. But um, I suspect by the Act and Law of the AFC, this is simply taking you back to the general provisions of the um, uh, constitutional statute, uh, which include um, a provision of that um, where there's no express choice, or which uh, lead to a conclusion that where there's an express choice, then you um, take uh, the law most um, appropriate, uh, which is the, certainly the tenor of the other regulations which I've um, been through. Um, So um, there is a, another provision which is perhaps worth a specific mention in the contract regulation in Article 7, um, and that is a provision that any contract governed by these regulations is subject to the jurisdiction of the court unless otherwise expressly provided in a contract. Now, that um, might, on the face of it, be seen as... Um, adding an extra head of jurisdiction to the four basic heads which I've stressed. Um, what is meant by contract governed by these regulations is the suggestion that um, uh, you put in your contract a provision, this contract is governed by the regulations, the AIFC regulations, and it imputes an agreement to the court's jurisdiction, or does that automatically mean that it counts as a, a, a which um, has been um, made between the parties or relates to activities conducted in the AIFC? Um, I think that is a little obscure. Um, I doubt a mere agreement to be governed by AIFC law means that your um, agreement is um, um, agreeing to the court's jurisdiction, but it may be. I think it'll have to be uh, argued out as um, whether that um, is the case or whether it, that means that um, you are conducting activities in the AIFC um, to establish common law-based decision-making in Central Asia. Now, the common law 
has long experience over centuries of pr pragmatic standard setting and adjudication on financial disputes. And it has over recent decades established some firm footholds in parts of the world outside the UK. Hong Kong and of course Singapore are a long-standing common law jurisdiction. Singapore has developed an active international commercial court itself. But then in the Middle East, we have uh, various centers, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, the Qatar courts, as further examples of new courts. And um, the um, common law basis is one which is, um, as I've indicated, up front in the constitutional statute uh, itself. Um, uh, the constitutional statute provides in Article 4.1, Paragraph two, that AIFC Act may be based on principles and legislation of England and Wales and the standards of leading global financial centres, while Article 13.5 um, uh, says they are based, AIFC is based. And consistently with this, the body of law, contract, tort, etc., which I've um, uh, mentioned has been developed by regulations adopted by the governor, um, does base itself very firmly on English common law and um, it regulates, um, for example, contract law uh, in terms familiar to any common lawyer. But while common law and English common law in particular will inevitably constitute a strong pull on the court when it decides cases, it is binding, it's merely inspirational. Uh, that's what the word may be based uh, or are based uh, in. And it is to be expected that the AIFC court will be receptive to other outside influences, uh, including, no doubt, from Kazakhstan, in the best traditions of modern comparative law-oriented common lawyers worldwide. So I hope that gives you a, an overall perspective of the court's jurisdiction. Uh, of course, there are other questions. Um, I've been dealing with the question, when is the court entitled to adjudicate in respect to what sorts of disputes um, but once an issue is within the court's jurisdiction and it then goes on to decide what law to apply, of course, a whole new topic arises. How is that jurisdiction in practice exercised? What powers does the court have? What procedures does it not adopt? These matters are comprehensively and flexibly covered in Article 27 of the court regulations in a way which makes me confident that the court will be able to do justice between disputing parties speedily and cost effectively as well as time effectively. And so far, the uh, limited number of court cases which has come before the court have been um, dealt with um, very speedily and efficiently. Let me just say uh, next uh, a few words about the International Arbitration Centre, um, which um, under the constitutional statute is to hear disputes on the basis of an arbitration agreement between the parties uh, and is to be established and to act in accordance with um, a resolution um, which I've already mentioned uh, in passing um, of the council on the IAC. Uh, the constitutional statute says that its awards are to be recognized and enforced in the Republic in the same way as arbitration awards issued by arbitration institutions in the Republic. Um, you simply need a translation into a Kazakh or Russian language in accordance with the procedure determined by AIFC acts. Um, and then um, awards of arbitration courts in the Republic are of course also um, to be recognized and enforced in the territory of the AIFC. The arbitration provisions uh, in the regulations, in the arbitration regulations of the 5th of December 2017, mirror very closely those which um, anyone familiar with the New York Convention 1958 will recognize. Um, they um, give um, the AIFC court the role of recognizing and enforcing arbitral awards, whether domestic or foreign, um, or in the limited circumstances which are permitted by the New York Convention, declining to recognize and enforce. But they also provide for the um, IAC to have an important role in supporting 
uh, sorry, for the AIFC Court to have an important role in supporting arbitration in the IAC. For example, by staying or dismissing court proceedings brought in breach of an arbitration clause. Again, consistently with the New York Convention, but applying that um, domestically as well as uh, in an international context. Appointing an arbitrator where parties have failed to agree as they should have done on one. Granting interim relief uh, where the arbitration um, tribunal can't necessarily give fully effective relief. Deciding whether an arbitration should be removed, for example, for incapacity or misconduct, or is incapable of acting, recognizing and enforcing awards that I've already mentioned, or refusing to do so, and um, setting aside an award made in the IAC on one of the limited grounds permitted under the New York Convention. Um, those are reflected um, in um, Article 44, recourse to a court against an arbitral award made in the seat of the AIFC may only be made by an application for setting aside in accordance with this article. It may only be made to the AIFC court. It may only be set aside um, if um, on proof that a party was under some incapacity or not given proper notice of the appointment of the arbitrator or the dispute award dealt with a dispute not contemplated by or falling within the terms of the agreement to arbitrate or goes beyond that agreement uh, or the composition of the arbitral tribunal or the arbitral pr procedure was not in accordance with that agreed or the subject matter of the dispute isn't capable of settlement by arbitration or the award is in conflict with public policy of the Republic. Um, and then there's a limited time for applying to set aside three months um, and um, so on. So those are familiar provisions which um, put the IAC on um, a, um, an internationally recognized basis, both as regards domestic and international arbitration. Uh, but it is also apparent from them that the AIFC court has, in reality, a further head of exclusive jurisdiction uh, promoting the cause of arbitration, and that is its um, jurisdiction um, of a limited but important nature um, in respect of um, the supervision, as one may put it, of arbitration, the furtherance of the cause of arbitration. And um, the success of arbitration is already a notable feature of the remarkable enterprise which is constituted by the AIFC and the court. And um, it is, of course, um, along with the existence of um, the court, um, an essential guarantor of the rule of law in the AIFC. Um, one hopes, I hope very much, uh, that this has um, shown to you um, that both the court and the arbitration centre uh, have an important future uh, as guarantors of the rule of law um, in relation to AIFC participants, in relation to activities conducted in the AIFC, in relation to circumstances where other AIFC bodies uh, um, may be challenged, where their acts may um, be challenged, and above all, of course, um, where parties wish in exercising the elective jurisdiction, the election um, being to choose uh, their jurisdiction um, whenever parties wish. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Lord Nance. Um, we will now, if we may, turn to some questions. Um, we have received an unprecedented number of questions uh, for our webinar series. I suggest that we do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the time that we have available. We have 15 minutes left uh, uh, of this uh, webinar session. I should say a number of the questions are not related to jurisdiction. And uh, if I may, Lord Mance, perhaps at the end, before we close the session, I could probably deal with a number of those very, very quickly in two or three minutes. Um, and May uh, has come from a participant, that is, uh, what happens if, if there is a conflict between uh, a decision of the AFC court and the local courts? That's a very interesting question. Uh, one would hope, of course, um, that no conflict arises. Uh, the way courts normally deal uh, with this is uh, that if there are prior proceedings on foot in another jurisdiction, 
then um, they consider whether it's appropriate uh, to exercise um, their own jurisdiction and um, parties will normally apply to one or other or both courts uh, obviously in their own interests so they may have conflicting views about this they probably will um, to sort out the question which court should go ahead uh, but um, if um, uh, if um, it got to a situation where both courts I would say unfortunately said that they would go ahead uh, then in theory you can have um, conflicting judgments and um, the normal rule would be that um, in each jurisdiction um, the local judgment would be regarded as um, uh, the definitive one uh, of course um, there is a potential problem um, when it comes to um, an attempt to enforce um, in jurisdiction A a, a judgment given in jurisdiction B when the jurisdiction A has itself got its own judgment. Um, again, normally um, that would, I think, um, um, create a, a um, real problem about enforcing the foreign uh, judgment. Um, as I say, I believe that um, both the AIFC court, I'm confident the AIFC court, uh, I'm sure also the Kazakh court um, would do its absolute best to avoid a flat uh, competition of jurisdiction. Uh, this is um, most unfortunate when it happens. It can occasionally happen. Um, common law courts um, used to be able in the European sphere to um, actually issue injunctions to restrain them um, proceedings in other European countries uh, that ceased to be possible under European law um, it's um, possible in other contexts but um, I don't want to go into that um, possibility here uh, as I believe um, uh, both the ARC court and the local Kazakh court uh, would do their utmost to avoid the sort of conflict that's being postulated uh, we are um, on extremely good terms with the local uh, Kazakh um, um, judges and courts and uh, it is our desire in the AIFC court to cooperate not to compete in that sense obviously uh, we offer a particular service which is designed to be suitable for the AIFC and for parties electing our jurisdiction uh, but we are said not um, going to um, get involved I believe and hope in the sort of dispute that you've um, the questioner has contemplated. Thank you very much, Lord Mance. Um, may I try and offer some assistance in addition to that, um, based on our experience in Qatar, where we had a very similar court um, some years ago. And I just wanted to emphasize, if I may, the importance of the cooperation that we have at the AFC court with the local courts, in particular the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan. And what that understanding has done has hopefully paved a way for. Uh, less opportunity, if you like, for potential conflict between the local courts and ours at the AFC court. It was proven in Qatar to be very successful because of that understanding. And as a sideline, I think it will hopefully prove to be beneficial to, to this issue for us in the future. Right, uh, perhaps a slightly easier question <laughs> next, if I may. Uh, what are the advantages of using the AIFC court instead of using the arbitration centre? I think the answer is that um, arbitration is a very welcome form of dispute resolution uh, in the sense that parties um, can exercise a certain degree over procedures. Uh, that said, uh, it is um, quite often, um, although not I think in the case of the AIFC, um, um, no quicker than um, court proceedings. Um, Clearly, the court has some powers um, which um, arbitrators um, uh, may not um, have so effectively. Um, I've indicated in the context of the court's um, um, supervision um, in relation to arbitration uh, that the court may be required to act, for example, granting in relief and so on, injunctive relief, um, uh, in a way which um, 
is more effective. Uh, so if you're looking for that sort of radical intervention, uh, courts and um, um, the power of courts is um, uh, appreciable and um, or prefer to agree to arbitration. It's in private, uh, it's um, confidential. Um, so it has that uh, advantage. Um, court, uh, of course, um, has the considerable advantage that um, it is not confined like arbitration to those who've agreed uh, 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 on, um, uh, on it. Um, in other words, um, if you have a multi-party dispute or a dispute which involves third parties or you want to bring in other parties and say, well, if I'm liable, then so as somebody else should contribute, um, then court is the place for you because um, in arbitration, you can't do that. And um, that is um, a, a distinct um, problem um, which um, can frequently arise with arbitration. Thank you, Lord Mance. A question about judicial mediation, which we provide as a service at the AFC Court. Uh, what is it and how does it work? Well, judicial mediation uh, is a, a form of dispute resolution which um, um, involves, instead of an outside mediator, it involves asking the judge. It can involve asking the judge to give uh, a preliminary view. Um, it, it, it can involve uh, asking the judge to um, uh, try and um, um, arrange an agreement. But uh, of course, a judge who acts in those ways, uh, it can't act in determining the dispute. So I think judicial mediation is uh, not likely to be something which is dominant in the court's activities, uh, because um, in truth, um, there are experienced um, mediators, probably um, in many cases, more experienced mediators uh, out there uh, in the market. Um, and the judicial mediator is um, exercising a function which is not um, the primary judicial function. And unless they've had um, uh, special training, uh, it may not be uh, uh, as appropriate to use them. But I, I don't want to downvalue the um, um, role. It's one I'm not uh, familiar with myself, I, except that I have observed it um, in um, Germany, where um, it is the role of um, judges, the positive role under the law to encourage mediation. And I've sat with German judges for periods and watched them uh, try and say to the parties, look, um, wouldn't you like to discuss this sort of resolution of this dispute? And it did occur to me, um, they go on and deal with the substantive issue then, uh, that that was a very difficult uh, exercise because um, they were um, in reality um, committing themselves to um, views about the merits of the case, which were, they were then um, at that stage were undecided and which later they were supposed to decide um, uh, impartially. Thank you, Lord Mance. Um, I think you've answered this question already, Lord Mance, but it is a question we've received, uh, so we should address it quickly if we can. Um, can an administrative act of the state of Kazakhstan, um, uh, can a dispute relating to that be brought to the AFC court? Well, insofar as it's a dispute um, uh, relating to an act of the AIFC body, um, then um, the court has jurisdiction over it, express jurisdiction uh, over the um, validity of um, acts, um, both in the executive sense and in the legislative sense of AIFC bodies. AIFC bodies adopt acts, one might call them regulations or rules, um, but they also do acts, they uh, no doubt uh, exercise powers um, purportedly, and uh, if there's any challenge to those, that is precisely the sort of um, uh, dispute that the court um, can um, adjudicate on. And just coming back to um, the question about arbitration, of course, it's the sort of dispute which is uh, most unlikely to be the subject of any arbitration agreement, though it might be. Thank you, Lord Mance. Um, why would a party choose to use the AFC court as opposed to the local courts of Kazakhstan for, for, uh, um, to resolve their disputes? Well, I hope I've explained that um, we offer a uh, particular service we've just set up and designed uh, because of the perceived um, experience in relation to civil and commercial uh, disputes of um, common law-based courts, 
Uh, and um, if that is something that you value and uh, the commercial community worldwide um, clearly does value it, uh, then um, the AIFC court um, offers adjudication um, on that basis. Uh, it, of course, also offers uh, adjudication primarily in the English language, um, so that um, businessmen who have, um, uh, or investors who have conducted um, their affairs in English, um, as is very often the case, um, uh, will find that their documents are um, read, construed, and applied by uh, English-speaking judges uh, in accordance with um, the principles of which um, of common law, which um, they um, probably also have some understanding of. Thank you, Lord Mance. Um, very good question, um, although we could talk about it for a while. Um, how does case management pre-trial work at the AFC Court? Well, case management is uh, obviously important. Um, common law judges have learned in recent decades that um, you need to take a grip at an early stage of commercial cases. Uh, you don't um, uh, permit cases simply to run um, according to the party's wishes. That, that of course, is a, 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 a one of the differences from arbitration, which uh, sometimes exists, though I don't believe the IAC will um, uh, simply allow cases to run into the distant grass. I think um, the IAC is run on the basis that um, uh, arbitrators are very conscious of, the, of their duties to um, ensure the quick um, resolution of disputes. But case management in court um, is done informally. It, it can be done, um, doesn't need to be done um, by um, formal hearings, although in these days of uh, remote um, um, discussion, it, it's um, now uh, going to be, I think, very common to do it in this sort of way. Um, and um, what it is designed to do is to set a timetable for a case, sometimes to set cost parameters, um, uh, uh, but set a, a, a timetable so everybody knows where they're going uh, and um, uh, so that um, evidence can, pleadings can be exchanged, memorials or pleadings, um, evidence can be gathered um, and um, uh, the case can come on quickly. Thank you, Lord Mance. Um, we have a question about enforcement. And I wonder if I might be able to offer some assistance um, in the interest of time. But first question is the, the constitutional statute refers to uh, judgments with reference to enforcement, but not to specifically orders. Can we enforce through the AFC court judgments and orders? And the answer seems to me to be very clear from the court regulations at 2017. Um, uh, and that is if you, if the person who asked that question would like to look at regulation 40, subsections one and two, it very clearly states judgments, orders and directions uh, uh, with reference to execution orders. I can also say that in practice that this has happened successfully. We have enforced judgments and orders uh, together or on their own uh, in the AFC court with our step-by-step -step specially agreed procedure between the AFC court and the enforcement agencies of Kazakhstan. And that has been done to 100% uh, satisfaction as quickly as possible. It works because we have that system. There is, and this relates to another question we received on enforcement, we have an escalation procedure within that procedure which enables us to go direct to the Minister of Justice if it is enforcement in Kazakhstan against uh, state assets or direct to the Chairman of the National Bailiffs um, Centre if it is enforcement against private assets. And again, we have not needed to do that yet, happily, but we can do so and we have the relationships and people in place to ensure that will work. With enforcement, we, uh, as closely and as appropriately as possible in a particular case, we support parties on enforcement, it's the party's obligation, but we're there to support through our relationship and procedure at every step of the way. And we have been doing that so far to ensure that uh, the, the ultimately so far the money has been uh, paid up uh, uh, as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Yes, I think that's a very good example. Thank you for that um, explanation. The constitutional statute says that decisions of the AIC court are to be enforced in the Republic and uh, the um, court regulations two days earlier say judgments, orders and directions are to be. Uh, it's a very good example of the need to, uh, to read the doc these documents, which were two days apart, together. The constitutional statute shouldn't be read by itself. It should be read together with the um, uh, 
um, court regulations and the arbitration regulations uh, two days earlier, 5th of December 2017, and you get a homogeneous picture. Thank you, Lord Vance. Um, we have a, a few other questions. May I deal with them very quickly? They don't all relate to the court. I think we could deal with them in 60 seconds. Um, firstly, about there will be received a question about registering uh, joint stock companies at the AFC. I'm afraid this is not something the court can advise upon, but I would encourage the person who asked the question to contact APSA, the independent regulator of the AIFC, which is responsible for registration of companies. Um, rights of audience question. Um, we can deal with this on a case by case basis as we do. Please send an email to the AFC court info at info uh, email address, which is shown via the AFC court website. Um, we had a question about the content of a contract for deals in the AFC. Again, this is not something the court uh, would be in a position to comment on uh, in an advisory capacity. This would be a question for APSA, the regulator, or for the AFC authority. Uh, all I'd like to say, if I may, about contracts is please consider including the AFC court and or arbitration centre at the AFC in your dispute resolution clause, um, which we are uh, increasingly seeing happening. As Lord Mance mentioned earlier, uh, we have managed to secure uh, inclusion in uh, various standard contracts of Chevron, um, Tengra Chevron in Kazakhstan, and we're working very hard with a number of other large corporations, benchmark companies, the corporations in Kazakhstan for the same achievement for the long term future success of caseworker at the court. We had a question about uh, does it matter what the value of the dispute is? Well, the answer is no. Uh, if the value of the dispute is up to 150,000 US dollars or less, then it will qualify for the special fast track small claims procedure which Lord Mance referred to the Small Claims Court earlier in his webinar presentation. Um, that can be extended up to 300,000 US dollars if the parties agree in accordance with the rules at the AFC Court Rules 2018 on the Small Claims Court procedure. Um, the, and we have received um, disputes already of all values from very small to, to more significant. That is it in terms of the questions we're able to ask, I'm, I'm afraid, during the course of this webinar. Um, may I ask um, participants, if you have other questions now or later, please feel free to email them to us, uh, English or Russian or Kazakh. Uh, we have the resources or perhaps any other languages, if you so wish, uh, and we will do our best to reply in writing uh, or, if necessary, via telephone or video. Uh, Lord Vance, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the proceedings? No, I'd like to thank everybody um, who's taken the trouble to um, uh, and the interest um, to look at this um, and follow this webinar uh, for doing so. And um, please um, keep in touch, um, in particular with the registrar, who, as um, you can see and know, is um, uh, extremely uh, informative and helpful. Thank you very much, Lord Vance. Thank you very much to uh, all of the participants who participated today. I understand there's a certificate of appreciation for anyone who would, would like to receive one. Um, if you'd like to write to the uh, AFC Court Registry, again, through the AFC Court info uh, email address, uh, and our team will be in contact shortly. Um, we will be hosting some other webinars before we come to the end of this year. I said before, this is our 24th. Uh, this is partly because of the pandemic, of course, but we are encouraging everyone to participate as much as possible. We'll be in contact with all of you through our extensive database of contacts, and we will also uh, keep you updated via our newsletter, which is now going out once or twice a year with our latest developments. So once again, thank you very much, Lord Mance. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us thank today. You. This now closes the uh, webinar for today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>